Welcome to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. I'm your host, Matt Halloran. Being your own loud is not new to marketing, but the mindset, strategies, and resources to help you get there are evolving faster than this industry is keeping up. It is time to find a new perspective on what works why and how to move your business forward. Listen as I interview guests to help you learn from them how to be your own loud. Let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to another Top Advisor Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Haller. Now, we get asked all the time, I mean, like conferences and sales and just hanging out with people, all about leads, man. Like, it's just all about leads and leads, 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 right? And what they don't understand is it's not an A plus B equals C equation. You actually need to have a system. And so Hillary is our guest today. She's the founder of Monetta Copy. She does content strategy and copywriting for financial advisors. The second time on the show, I've been on her show, which by the way, you need to listen to. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But she had this amazing post on LinkedIn that got huge traction, really about, about lead generation and nurture sequences of the lead funnel. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So Hillary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm so excited to be here and so honored to be asked back for a second time. So I'm excited for this conversation. Listen, I like hanging out with podcasters. You're a podcaster. You're a known commodity sister. You're really good at this. Not only good behind the microphone, but you're really good at what you do. So, okay, we have to use some operational definitions here because I think a lot of people just don't really understand the foundation of what we're talking about today. So when we talk about lead generation slash lead funnels, lead magnets. See, we're going to, I don't want to distort everything. Where do you want to begin with this part of the conversation? Sure. Let's start with maybe the 30,000 foot view of what a lead funnel might look like. I think there's two pieces at the top that are top of funnel that you might have where anyone can find you, right? It's, it might be social media posts and then it might be your long form content as well. Blogs, YouTube videos, podcasts, these are things that people can find, but you don't know if they're watching. You don't know if they're reading. You don't know what they think. You really have no control over that. They don't have to interact with you at all. They might just be passively consuming it. You don't know. Then down below that, we have your email system, which I would consider middle of the funnel. And you get a lot more insight into who's opening those emails, who's clicking on things in those emails things like that. And in the middle there, we need some sort of mechanism that gets people from that top of funnel content into that email system. And so that's where a lead magnet comes in. It's that key or that mechanism that people opt into. They share their email address with you and then they get into your email system. So th that's how I see it. I'm curious to know if you have anything to add there that I maybe have missed. I don't think you've missed anything. We just have a little different terminology. We proud mouthy and eyes everything here. You know, that's basically, and we, this is actually, we stole it from somebody else. It's owned audience, right? And Hillary, that's what we get all the time, right? So clients who use our system, hundreds of advisors have used our systems over the years. And they're always saying, how do I really know the efficacy of this? Because a lot of it's just vanity metrics, right? And so being able to pull somebody off your long form content and your social media. And now my partner said this, and I love this quote. You're renting those audiences. If LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or any of those go down, you lost everything, right? How do you get them off of those social media channels and into your own audience, which you refer to as your email circuit or uh, email literature sequence? Now, I'm going to quote you. I'm going to read it here so I don't say this incorrectly. If you think you're going to spend money on anything in your marketing, it should be a lead magnet. So that's a bold statement, sister, and I like that, but I need you to unpack that a little bit. So what do you mean by that? It absolutely speaks to this notion of having an owned audience. And I think you have to be so strategic about what audience you want to own. You want to make sure that your owned audience is an audience that of people that you would actually really like to work with, right? It's not an audience that you own that's just anyone and everyone who's come into contact with you. It's people that you would actually be happy to get on a discovery call with. They're qualified to work with you. You would be excited to work with them. And so the lead magnet there is such an important piece of that because you want to make sure that it is attractive to the people that you would really like to work with and that it's not being downloaded by Joe Schmo, who you don't want to work with because he's not going to be a good person to have on your email list. And th there's that piece of it. You want it to be really strategic. 
But then there's also this piece, like you said, if LinkedIn goes down and all of your content is on LinkedIn, you've completely lost control over your audience. You you have to start from the ground up and rebuild it. If the LinkedIn algorithm changes, which I think is a lot more likely than LinkedIn going down completely forever, and all of a sudden your posts aren't getting shown in the feed anymore, that's a hit, right? That's a hit. Now, now you can adapt and you can adjust to that, but you don't have to. It's, the stakes aren't as high if you also have this owned audience. And so that's where I see the importance of a lead magnet really being. Now, I will add one other thing just to amend that quote that you shared with me. If I could choose two things for you to spend your marketing dollars on, it would be your lead magnet and it would, of course, be your website as well. But the lead magnet, I think, is people know they have to spend money on their website, right? And the lead magnet is one where people, they don't always realize the importance of it and how much it can actually help you get more book discovery calls. There's a lot there. I'm going to have to have you unpack two or three points. And I hope I remember all two or three of them. So the first one is, you have to have a lead magnet that's going to attract your ideal target market, right? How do you do that? I, that's one of the, you know, we still get resistance. In fact, so I was just at an event last week, this week, and I was sitting down and talking with a whole table full of advisors. And they luckily, and I was very grateful that they actually had an idea who we were. And one of the advisors was like, oh, Matt, I heard you talking about how important it was to have a niche. And I was like, yeah, well, my niche is women. Dude, this 51% is the majority of the people in the world. How is that's not a niche, right? But how do you create a lead magnet that is going to attract the right people? Can you give us some examples of what those might be? Yeah, absolutely. So, and this is the caveat here, right? I think lead magnets can be really, really powerful for people who have a really well-defined niche and they're dialed into their niche. I think when you don't have a niche, and I'll be honest, I've drank the Kool-Aid. I'm all for niching, right? I'm a big believer in the power of niching. When you don't have a niche, you're going to have a harder time getting people to download your lead magnet, much less getting the right people to download your lead magnet. So when I think about creating a lead magnet with your niche in mind, there's a couple ways that that you can go about this. And I'll start with an example. One is one that I've worked on recently this year. It was an ebook. I know you refer to that as a white paper sometimes. I, I really like the term ebook because I think when I think of ebooks, I think of something that's maybe covering a broader range of topics for somebody. And this particular ebook also had a lot of workbook components to it. And so this particular one was called Mastering Millennial Money, the most comprehensive guide on the internet for millennials who want to take control of their finances. And it consisted of various fairly short chapters that were about issues that were really pertinent to millennials specifically, the financial issues that millennials specifically are facing. And that is a an ebook that is only going to get downloaded by millennials. It's not going to be downloaded by retirees because retirees are facing different money issues. <laughs> and so what I like to think about when you have your niche and you're trying to come up with a lead magnet idea you think about what are the specific problems that my niche faces that nobody else really faces? And then I also like to think about what's preventing them from being ready to work with me right now? And can I think of a lead magnet that's going to help them get closer to that point where they're ready to work with me? And sometimes for this particular example that I just shared, I think one reason that a lot of millennials are reluctant to work with financial advisors or maybe two reasons, is one, they don't believe that they have enough money yet to warrant working with a financial advisor. And so what this lead magnet did was it really communicated that this particular advisor knows what millennials are dealing with and how he can help them, even if they don't have millions to invest with him. They don't need that. So the idea here is how are we going to get the attention? So let's stick with the millennial thing there. So it was small chapters, ebook with a workbook, and it was going to appeal to them. So I'm assuming that if they actually Google searched it or does their long form content drive them? Is there a call to action from their long form content or their website or their socials? How do those plug into getting them to consume this ebook, this white paper? To to get this ebook, I think there's lots of different ways to get people to get your 
lead magnet in front of people. And you need to take advantage of as many of those ways as you can. So number one, having it on your website. So anyone who does land on your website, however they land there, can see the ebook is here. Creating social posts with a link to that ebook in the comments where people can download it. So important. If you're on LinkedIn, you can have featured posts. You need a featured post with your lead magnet, right? If you are writing blogs, I used to, when I was early in this field, I used to always just link to a lead magnet at the end of a blog. And then I realized most people don't read to the end of a blog, right? And so I've seen quite a few advisors, they link to their lead magnet at the top of the blog page, the top of every blog page, or they link to it at the, on the side of the blog page. So it's really easily, it's really easy to find for anyone who clicks over to your blogs from Google or wherever it might be. Anyone who has a YouTube channel can link to their lead magnet in the YouTube description. Anyone who has a podcast can link to their lead magnet in the show notes. They can talk about it in their outro. Now, one caveat with that, I've run into this with my own business is sometimes I'll create a lead magnet for my business that I'm really excited about in a certain season or period. And then I decide I want to change that lead magnet and this I'm not offering a service anymore that's relevant to this lead magnet. And so that can be kind of tricky to go back into podcast outros or show notes or whatever and remove that link from every single one. So sometimes I'm a little hesitant if it's a new lead magnet and you're not completely sure you're committed to it yet to, to put it in places like that. In that case, I would rather have a way for them to just subscribe to a newsletter or something that's going to live forever and you're never going to change. But I do think there are just so many opportunities to share the link to your lead magnet to a landing page where they can download it. And and those are just a few of them. Now, you talked at the top of the show that you the website is the other thing that you think people should spend a bunch of money on, which I totally agree. And dear God, please don't have it be two old white people walking on the beach holding hands, which, by the way, saw another one of those, which is really, really, really frustrating just because it makes you look like everybody else. Now, I'm not a huge fan of when I'm on a website and 10 seconds later, there's a pop up that tells me to download something. What how do you manage the expectations because you just said that needs to be easily accessible on the website socials and all of those things, right? Which I'm hanging my hat on that because I firmly 1 million percent agree with you on that. But how do you do it on a website? How do you make it so that people will get driven to that page? Is that your CTA? Is that where you're trying to get everybody to just click to so it seems less invasive? Help me with that. Oh, this is such a tough question, Matt. And the reason it's tough for me, so I'm going to, I think I'm going to lay out what the different options are. And I really think it depends on what you're comfortable with as the business owner, what you think your audience is most comfortable with. Because like you, I also just hate the pop-up that blocks me from reading. I'm likely to click away at that point. One alternative to that, that I actually am a fan of is the pop-up that comes up in the corner of the website at a certain point. So it doesn't block you from reading, but it does still pop up and grab attention that way. So if you have one of those corner pop-ups with the lead magnet, I think that's a good alternative. I also just really like this notion of, I mentioned if you have a blog on your website and you have it at the top of every blog post or off to the side of every blog post, you have some sort of opt-in form that you're embedding onto each page. And so if you can also embed that opt-in, that same opt-in form on your homepage and on your contact page or wherever else, just make it whatever page people are on or whatever page they're most likely to land on first, put that form link there or embed that form there so that they can find it. I really like putting it on a contact page because some people will click over to the contact page but not be ready to contact you yet, and you still have a chance to grab them. It's a lot less of a lift for them to say, okay, I do still want to hear from this person, get to know them a little bit more before I'm ready to book that Calendly call with them. I think that can be another. I'll give you my phone number and my email address and my first name and my last name and my date of birth. It's unbelievable what some people will ask now. You know, so we've been focusing a little bit on this ebook, right, as, as a really good way. What are some other examples of lead magnets that we can incorporate in case that isn't our bag of tricks? Yeah, absolutely. And I will say a lot of people are very against ebooks and white papers because they're a little bit longer. They're boring, right? They, or they can be boring. They don't have to be boring. But there are so many options for lead magnet, 
excuse me, lead magnets, especially for financial advisors. A couple creative ones that I really like are if you have a really compelling case study, whether it's hypothetical or it's real, I think that really depends on your compliance department, or you even have a little collection of case studies that, you know, are, again, very specific to your niche, someone would say, see themselves in those case studies and say, oh, they helped them with this problem. I have that problem. Let's see how they did it. And case studies can be a great option. One that I see a lot that I actually don't like is budget templates, because I think that budget templates, this is why I don't like them. I think that budget templates, they have to be very dynamic, right? I think that everybody has, we can all go download a budgeting app that makes it easier for us to use that that makes it easier for us to budget rather than using somebody's spreadsheet. Now, I will say if you have a specific niche or with a very specific budgeting need or budgeting problem, and you can create a budget template for that that someone can use, if you have fluctuating income, here's the budget for you, right? Something like that, then that can be good. But otherwise, I like to stay away from budget templates because they're just so overdone and I just don't think they're really compelling anymore. But other good ones that I've seen are specific workbooks. So workbooks to help people reduce debt or workbooks to help people do their own tax planning or whatever it might be. I think those can be good. And then another one, I actually see financial coaches doing a lot more with this type, but I think they can work for financial advisors as well, are quizzes. I will say, and I'd love to ask you this question, Matt, I don't know how certain compliance departments would feel about quizzes. I'm curious if you have any insights. I don't know anybody who's doing that. So whoever's listening to this right now, like I don't, I'm sorry, I was just scanning my brain there thinking to myself, who have I seen? All of the other ones that you listed are things that I've seen quite successful when it comes to a lead magnet, but quizzes, I don't know how many advisors, that, that's not true. So Thomas Kopelman does that regularly on Twitter. In fact, I've seen a bunch of people do that on Twitter. Now he is an RIA, so he has a little bit more flexibility there, but I'm telling you, that's such a magnificent way to engage people. I really love that. And Hillary, one of the things that I really like about uh, chatting with my fellow marketing uh, friends is you can uncover stuff like this, right? So listen, if you're listening to this and and you can, all you have to do is ask the question. And then you have to ask the follow-up question, which is what can I do to make this compliant? Which is, I think, one of the best questions you can ever have when you're actually talking with your compliance department, especially if they say no is a wonderful way to engage. But I'm going to go back to the worksheets because one of the other things that we have seen is checklists. So people really like checklists. Now you said like a budgeting thing, like a budgeting form or checklist, but just having an overall checklist, are your kids, you know, are your kids ready to go to college? Here are 10 things that you need to have. Click here and I'll send you this thing. And I've seen a bunch of people, in fact, I interviewed this guy many moons ago and yeah, he just came back into this weird conversation that I had that like, do you know this guy? I was like, yeah, I interviewed him like episode like 200 and that's his lead magnet. His lead magnet is, so your kids were just born. Here's the college checklist. They just turned 13. Here's the college. They just took, started studying for their SAT or maybe they're in AB classes or whatever. And he's got all of these checklists and that's how he fills up his pipeline. I just think that's a, that's really, really cool. Now I have to, dive a little deeper and maybe turn the screws on you a little bit more because I don't fully think our audience understands how you're going to differentiate using this lead magnet and having the right people download the lead magnet. So can you unpack that a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. So I love this example of the checklist that you just brought up here because I think checklists are they also work really really well if they're specific for a specific market of people this advisor I'm assuming clearly loves to help his clients do some education planning and he's probably knowledgeable in doing financial aid and dealing with student loans and making smart decisions around that and so that to me is a great example of getting the right people into your pipeline because that's what I'm then going to help you with whereas I think some of these more generic budget templates. So let's just take, I've created a generic budgeting spreadsheet and that's my lead magnet. And that's what I'm going to put out there. 
if you don't say who it's for or the budget spreadsheet doesn't help you achieve a specific goal, anyone who wants to budget might download that budget spreadsheet It could be a college kid who's definitely not ready to work with you, right? It could be someone who is getting ready to retire because they're like, I just need to budget for my retirement. But really, the people you like to work with are older millennials or Gen X, right? And they're needing to ramp up their savings or whatever it might be. So I think that's the importance of thinking about, can I make my lead magnet solve a really specific problem for a really specific person that then I can help them in my services when they're ready to work with me? It's the same problem that I'm going to dive deeper into with them. So I don't know if that answers if that helps provide some clarity. And I think that's the level of clarity that our listeners are really looking for with this, right? It's when you have the level of specificity so that it speaks to that audience, to the level that audience recognizes, right? That, oh, oh, Hillary wants to talk to me. Oh, wait, this is really valuable to me. I really like Hillary because she's giving me something that is going to make my life better. Oh, it's just an email address. That's fine. And then you get them into that, that owned audience. Now, I'm sure you and I could spend years talking about what to do next, right? Because after we own their audience and the lead magnets work, now they're a lead. Now what do we do? We don't have time for that. We'll have to either have you back or one of these days you and I need to share the stage and really dive deeply into these at a conference here in the near future because I know you're going to be indisposed a little bit here for a little while, but when you, I don't even know when that's going to be. So I'm not even going to go there, sister. Anyway, I want to thank you very, very much. Now, before, before we go though, so Jessica and I were working, Jessica produces the show and we were working on the questions that we were going to ask you about the lead magnets and stuff. And it was based off of social media posts that, by the way, I think we're just going to link to in the show notes so that people can see the conversation. It's a very good conversation, but what should I have asked you that I didn't? And, uh, we don't have time to get into email sequences, which is what you should do after But I think that's there's two other parts to this lead magnet for it to be really, really effective and for it to actually result in those book discovery calls, which is what you want when you get people into your email list. I don't think it's enough to create just a simple opt-in form for a lead magnet. When you create your opt-in form, you want to have a little bit of copy there, maybe some bullet points of the benefits of the lead magnet. You want to sell the lead magnet, even though it's free, right? You want to really sell that lead magnet so that they are like, I absolutely need this. I'm not even going to hesitate to put my email address into this opt-in form. And so that's, I think, maybe the one piece that we haven't talked about yet. And yes, we could spend a whole another episode talking about the welcome sequence that comes on the back end that you need with the lead magnet. But that opt-in form or the landing page, if you're sending people to a specific landing page to download, and I'm sorry if that's, like, again, more jargon that I would need to define. But wherever it is that people can actually input their first name and their email address, and I wouldn't ask any more questions than that, have a little bit of copy there that really speaks to the benefits or what they will get out of this lead magnet. We do need to dive more deeply into the back end of that because I think what ends up happening is people build these email nurture sequences and it's so aggressive. Like for instance, uh, I just bought a pair of jeans online there's a very specific company that I'm old, right? Uh, these just fit me well and I like them and they're super comfy and whatever. And, uh, but so I bought five, six pairs of jeans from this company, but man, after I buy it, it's like, they just like, every day or in my email, I would know I unsubscribe. Right. And I don't want that. Right. I want you to be top of mind, but not like schmucky salesy. What can I do to get you in this car today? And this could just be a great social media post that you and I need to maybe potentially work on together too, is what is the cadence that's appropriate? How can you keep top of mind without being annoying? I just, I, that stuff drives me crazy. All right. Anyway, Hillary, I'm sure that there are going to be people who are going to want to reach out to you and find out more about who you are and what you do. Where should they go? What should they do? They can go to monetacopy.com. That's a website. I know you'll link to it in the show notes. Moneta can be a little hard to come up with the spelling on your own. I am always on LinkedIn. Hillary Gale Meehan is what I am on LinkedIn. I am, as you mentioned, going to be out on maternity leave for the rest of 2024 starting next week, but I'll be back in 2025 and my team is going to continue dropping podcast episodes and things like that. So I'll still be around, but just not as often as I usually am. And check out my podcast, the Finance Marketing Podcast, which you can find on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the only place, and I know 
I don't even want to say this out loud while I'm looking straight at Matt Haller, and the only place it's not yet is on YouTube. Oh, you just, that hurt me. I didn't know that. I would have poked you in the eye of that one way earlier. Yeah. you. Ha- yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's the second largest podcast player. And one of the things that has really blown us away, with we have a new something called Enhanced Video Services with our Managed Influence Services. And our clients right now, Larry, they're getting 10 to 20 times more interaction with the YouTube shorts than they're ever getting downloads. But you know what? The, here's the thing. You already have such a wonderful foundation of social proof and libraries that people can go to to learn from you. That's when you know implement that YouTube strategy. You're going to be even more successful than you are right now. And I wish you all of the success in the world. I'm so happy to count you as one of our friends here at Proudmouth. I know that my team absolutely loves the stuff that you post on social. So please, please, please follow Hillary on LinkedIn specifically. She's always putting out such good, high quality, zero click important content that you can just learn from very quickly. Now, I don't think you'll be surprised that there is a lead magnet built into that, but whatever. It's because she practices what she preaches. And we want to practice what we preach to your, to, to all of you too. So the long and the short of what where we're at with Proudmouth is this. Please just make sure that you're following us on social to pay attention to all of this stuff, because here between now and the end of 2025, we're launching a whole bunch of new stuff that you're going to want to pay attention to that I'm just going to tease you with right now. There are some really, really cool things that we've been working on. We've got a new team that is helping us really bring products to market, which is so wonderful, Hillary. I know that you and I have talked about that in the past. It's one of the biggest banes of being a marketing company is actually marketing for yourself instead of marketing for everybody else. And we're really excited to bring these things and we will. And so please stay tuned. And if you have not subscribed, make sure that you do. And more importantly, go check out our YouTube channel. And so I had to totally do that to you, sister, <laughs> because we do have a lot of stuff there. But anyway, for Hillary and all of us here at Crowdmouth, this is Matt Haller. And we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thanks for listening to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. If you want to know more about how you can be your own loud, visit us at proudmouth.com and sign up for the Pod Rocket Academy. Through courses and office hours led by professional podcast producers and digital marketers, you will learn everything you need to know to become the trusted subject matter expert you were meant to be.